So sick.
Um, I'll kick this off, and I'm going to say thanks to everyone for coming out. And um, I'd like to thank Brian Marcus for getting everyone together, putting us all together, um, and coordinating all this. I mean, every year, you know, there's two people that come in mind that really try to get everyone together. It's Ryan and Kevin Strict, and um, those two guys. I just want to thank you guys for putting all this together and um, <laughs> and, and always making this happen. And then, you know, next, I just want to um, thank these three guys right here. Um, had a lot of good, fun years with these guys and um, really taking something to the next level. And I guess we'll kind of start digging into some of that a little bit here. But, um, you know, thanks to these three guys right here. Um, had a lot of fun years with you guys, my man. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. So I'll echo that and just say thank you very much to Ryan and Skull Candy and Danny and BG um, for allowing us to have this amazing space tonight and for Ryan and Kevin and all the hard work they did and Danny to get this place ready, share some memorabilia from the good old days. Um, I got to go to Tampa for about 17 hours last Sunday. Uh, it was the 30th anniversary of the pro contest and I went to Tampa for the first time about 30 years ago, almost exactly, and was like, okay, I gotta go. And it is an amazing family reunion of skateboarding. Like, in this room, I see people that I've known for more than 30 years, um, worked with these guys for more than 30 years, and we're always crossing paths. And it just, it just reminds me of the importance of the connections you build and the people you meet along the way and the things that matter. And skateboarding matters. We're sitting in a room in Costa Mesa 31 years after we started this 411 video magazine thing. And in some way, it's touched all of our lives, which I think is amazing. So thank you, everybody, for coming out. Thank um, you. Looking forward to, uh, to having this discussion tonight. All right. Hard to believe uh, what 411 meant to people. As we were doing it, the industry was really critical of what we were doing because we were delivering information really quick. And um, so we were just concerned about the criticism, right? And uh, over the years, I came to understand what it really meant to people, you know? And, and how it connected people all around the world. Um, and everybody wanted to be a filmer and everybody had a local filmer, right? And there was a purpose, right? So really amazing, and it's really, really rad to be here to, to share it. So thanks for being here. Um, so we, we, we started New Deal. I was uh, in charge of making the videos with Paul's help. So Paul did all the technical uh, background information. He sent me up with two TVs, right, with a mixing on. This is how technical I am, right? And so he's like, hey, this is what you do. This is the source video. This is the, what we're gonna record on. And this is how So I had this laborsome job of putting all this video together and you had it all timestamped, all the videos timestamped. So, I, so I, I made all these videos and watched all these videos and I had to write down what the trick was, what the, the beginning was the edit and the end the edit. And this was, I mean, we're talking books of just, just raw data. It was an absolute, absolute nightmare. And um, so anyway, so I did the first video, the, the uh, 15 minute promo. Paul, you came in to do all the, uh, the, um, the slow-mo stuff at the end, right? We added the music and all that. And then I did another video with the 1281, it was the same thing. I mean, this is, just to give you an idea, guys, when we made this, and this was in the system, I did use to swim toys in every single trip. In, I had to do it in order. There was no editing, insert editing. So it's like, okay, trip one to trip thousand, all in a row. And then I watched it and I went, I don't like that. And I had to look to every part and I go, I want to put this part by that part. And I had another, I just watched the whole thing again and went, right, okay. And then the second go was what you saw. So that's what making videos was around that time. And um, it was, as you can tell, it was, it was a nightmare. So, um, then I did uh, 1281, and uh, I was done by that point. I'm like, you know what? I am like, this is, it's getting ready to go digital, and you can tell how technically I am, right, from what I just said, and I'm like, I'm done with this. I'm gonna about to make a bad video. And this was a time when um, it was going digital, and Paul was at the head of that, and um, 
Yeah, so I, I was, I dropped out of engineering school in, in Colorado and moved to California to skate when I was 19. I was on flow for New Deal. And so I didn't know anything about California except that New Deal was in Costa Mesa. So I got two friends from Kansas. We packed up a, a U-Haul trailer on the back of my Escort and drove out here um, just to skate. Like I figured I could always go back to school. Um, but I ended up getting a job working in the warehouse at New Deal. And then I had a little bit of computer experience, so I started retouching graphics. And that was right around the time when Steve's like, I'm done. He's like, do you want to make a video? And I was like, fuck yeah. Like, I want to make a video, of course. So Paul had been exploring this idea of digital video. And I think that's, yeah, so um, the way Steve made a video was the same way every kid made a sponsor video, where you had two decks and you basically stacked them up together, right? And um, I had the opportunity in the 80s, Unreal Productions, part of Vision, was in the front of my wood shop for six months, and Don Hoffman ran Unreal Productions, and they had the high-end equipment, you know? They had the, you know, half a million dollar editing bay, you know, with all the, all the stuff, right? You know, and that's where the contest videos that you saw of that era were, were made and done. So I got to see how that worked, and, um, Got to understand time code, so basically that's where Steve, we had time code with control of everything already. And then this system called Video FX came out, and we had a, what, a, a 2000 meg hard drive. It was $10, it was a disc array. It was a new bus card and a Mac FX. And um, we could digitize, digitize 30 frames a second at 240 by 320. And you would edit the video of that, and you had to know that it was tape number 12, and you put tape number 12 in the deck, and it would fast forward it, and then lay it down to the master. So it sort of had that machine control at the end, but basically it did postscript the tape when it was laying it down. So that's why the graphics and the wording in 401 always look better than the video, because no matter who shot it, if it was good, it was going in. Like, you know, it was about the content of the skateboarding, not the production value, right? Um, but basically with those tools and control, Josh saw it and related to it instantly. And I was like, oh, I got this, you know? And it was great, because basically, then I just had to stand around and be tech support for him. So then I uh, went over to London and I passed over the, the video to Josh. And uh, I was sitting in a pub with, uh, in, the, in the, called the Crown and Anchor in, in Covent Garden. Now I, I called that four on one pub, so if you're ever if you're ever in uh, Covent Garden in London, go to the pub with the Crown and Anchor because that was where the idea with Form 1 started. So I was having a drink with a couple of guys. One of the guys was Tim Lane Boyce, who many of you guys know is uh, a hero of mine. His guy got me to skate in contests. He was the guy that did the, the Rad magazine. Um, anyway, so we were talking and he said to me, what's Rocco going to do next? Is he going to do a video magazine? And that's all he said. We didn't talk any more about that. And then in London, I called up Josh. And I go, Josh, how are you doing on the new deal? He's like, I'm done, I've done it. And I'm like, wow, that was quick. Pushy as I am, I which, which, which new deal video was it? Uh, the deal is dead. The deal is dead was the, the yeah. first video I edited. That was 1991. So then I said to him, how are you doing on Skype page? How are you doing on the Underworld video? And he's like, that's almost finished. And I'm like, wow, that's incredible. <laughs> and then I said, how are you doing on the zine? We were going to make a, like a, like a zine, a mad circle, Underworld element, and a new deal. And he's like, Steve, now that is labor support. The amount of time that takes to put video grabs to put it onto paper. And I'm, and I'm sitting there like anybody would say, oh my goodness, like you're making a video here, you've done it. This one's nearly done. But you want to make a zine, you're taking video grab. Obviously the next question was, why don't we just keep it on video? Right? He's like, that would be a lot, that would be a lot easier. So, and then it was like, well, and again, this was a brainstorm between me and Josh, and we were just like, well, what if it was not just our companies, what if it was everybody else? And it was like, and what if we did ads, etc. It was a brainstorm between me and Josh, which has all sounded great. But with all respect, Josh was just starting, and the company was owned by me, Andy, and Paul, we were the three, three partners. And, and how? And how. And uh, we've got to give a lot of respect to Andy, right? and I'll tell you the reason why I think it's like is, so Paul, I said, Paul, I've got this idea for this video magazine. And he's like, no. Like, I, I got too busy. You know, there's just too many things going on. 
And Justin, who's part of the crew, he started Mad Circle. Sure. Justin Gerard, thank you. <laughs> uh, um, and and Gorm, got Boberg, who was the hero of a lot of the New Deal graphics, along with Andy. He's like, did that? They did that. And so, but Andy, he was like, he got it straight away. He's like, I get it. I like it. And if it wasn't for Andy being in, really, in, in, you know, interested in it. Then we probably wouldn't have done four on one because I wouldn't have had the influence to do it and say, hey Andy, come on, Paul, let's do it. But Andy's got to get respect because he did, for one reason, he was into it from day one. And Andy wasn't involved, you know, Andy left a couple of, maybe a year after, six months after, whatever. But if you think back to the first four on one, and anybody that's launched a brand or anything or done a zine or anything like that, the first one is the kind of the hardest one, right? And so the influence that Andy made in that first one, all that planning, and all the icons, and all the things, I'm not saying that he did the icons, I'm saying everything that we did from issue one to the last issue didn't change a, 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 a lot, right? So seriously, like, I, I don't think Andy gets enough credit for what he did. As these guys started trying to push it out to shops and stuff, just talking about the idea didn't make any sense. Because we're like, hey, we're making a, a magazine, but it's on video and it's gonna come out every two months and people are gonna pay to have commercials in it and people are just looking at us like we're crazy. Um, so they sort of said like, hey, let's figure out if we can even make this. And that was using the equipment that Paul set up and the systems, like everyone talks, you know, everyone that worked at Form One, they talk about the systems that were in place. All those really came from Paul. Absolutely. He, Who didn't want to do Form One? He, he, when we started getting tapes in, he's like, here's how you number tapes. Here's how you keep track of stuff in a file maker database. Here's how you do these things, because if you don't do that, this, none of this will work. And it's funny, I was literally just talking to uh, Colin Kennedy, and he's like, yeah, like, what I learned from Forum One was organization, and he credited me, but that all, that all comes from Paul. So if anybody's pissed that your tape was paint penned on, <laughs> I'll take credit for that. <laughs> That's all, Paul. Did you, guys, um, did you guys sell ads for the first issue, or did you give them? No, we didn't sell them. Was that difficult? Convincing brands to advertise? Yeah, it was, it was, it was, a lot of it was difficult. At the time, you know, when you put a video camera in someone's face, people, that was, it didn't happen before. You know what I mean? For one, we, there was a lot of, you know, we didn't have something to, in a magazine, you're like, okay, I'm going to look like a magazine, you're going to have a cover. So there was no video magazine that we looked at and went, oh, we're just going to make a skateboard version of that. There wasn't it, right? So we had to kind of break it down and figure out and go, right, right, this, how would, if we make it a video magazine, how would we make it? Obviously, we got the cover, we need to have an intro, we need to have interviews, we need to have these different articles. And that's how we looked at it, just broke it down, and then we decided that's how we did all these different sections, and then oh, we had the icons. And, uh, and one of the things we wanted to do was do something positive for skateboarding. If you think back to 93, in my opinion, that was probably the most negative time of skateboarding. Skateboarding was very inconsistent. I remember doing demos, and the guys with the mums and dads would come out and go, hey, this is great. When's the pro skate? And I'm like, they've been skating for two or three hours. <laughs> you know, if you think about it, it was, you know, seven and a half inch white boards, blank, blank t-shirts, blank boards, you know, and it was very, very negative. It was, you know, and it was very extremely inconsistent, you know? And it was a lot of, you know, first skating was looked down upon, these sort of transition parts uh, was looked down upon. And what we wanted to do, was we wanted to show it with skateboard. And that was one of the early things we said with one of the t-shirts was grab the remote and kick back. And what that meant was, if you don't like what you look see, just fast forward through it. If you don't like what we report, fast forward through it. If you don't like transition skating, fast forward through it. If you don't want to see a contest, fast forward through it. So something different. And that was, we, we purposely wanted to do that because we wanted to show with skateboarding and we wanted to show global skateboarding. So that was Cap, very Cap's got something, I think. Um, how did you come up with the opener music and who wrote that? This is, this is a great question. That's a great question. So, one of, I, I, I wanted to have something that would be like Cheers, right? Or like a 60 minutes or something where you could be around the house, you're like, oh, 60, you know, Cheers is coming on. And then you like, and so, who was the guy that worked for it? Ken Wood. Ken Wood. And he had a band called Soul. And the song was Pop's Car, and you were just like, that's it. So I had gotten a bunch of music right. and, and Steve had kind of tasked me with like, hey, we need a theme song. Like, what's the theme song for Form 1? You want to you know when it starts. And so I was listening through all these tapes and all this music and we had a, it was actually a, a DAP, like a digital audio tape that Ken gave us of this band. 
and I heard Soul of the Boxcar, I'm like, okay, this is the one. So, so is that like the beginning of the song, or is it part of the song? It's, it's the beginning of the song. It actually is like a four or five minute song. Yeah, so there is a five minute song. Yeah, so we can thank you or blame you. You can, you can thank me or blame me for the dent. No, but, 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 the, but the rest of the song really isn't that good. Like, oh, it's cool. the, the, the there's actually the lyrics. Yeah. 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 yeah, there's yeah. actually yeah. lyrics to the song. Yeah. 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 The beginning yeah. of it's yeah. great, but the rest yeah. of it, come on. <laughs> That's literally so the best part of the song. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's like The Simpsons. Like when you hear the feels. Like, so good. Yeah. It, it did exactly what Steve wanted it to do, and it, it's yeah. it's been so much fun because it's like, you know, I'm in China at some world skate contest, and Vern plays <laughs> sort of the boxcar, and, and people are like, yep. you know, it, it's really it's really interesting the, the impact of music in those situations. But back, back to that, that sound, and you said this is this is the sound for that. This is and we never thought about changing it. No, that was the that was the theme song. Yeah. We did have the Muska remix. Yeah. <laughs> there's, I'm pretty sure there's at least footage footage of them in the credits at some yeah. point. Yeah, first issue. Yeah, first issue. Of them playing the band. Were you guys concerned at all that you wouldn't have enough footage to create this magazine? <laughs> and so <laughs> you were talking about the Cargill story, which I'm sure everyone wants to hear Cargill bit too. It seems like that would be the biggest concern is like getting content. I'm, I'm going to kick this off and I'm going to pass it to Ortiz because we got started on this idea and, and Steve and Ortiz are out like, Ortiz had been working on the, the New Deal video getting this footage and working, so he was already kind of in the family. He was working at Thrasher at the time, um, officially, but helping with New Deal video and out shooting photos and video. And so we started like, oh, we need to get footage for this thing. And I think that there was a little, I mean, there was definitely some concern in the beginning of like, are we gonna be able to get enough footage? But because of the relationships that Chris had out in the field every day shooting, photos and video with like every pro in the industry essentially. There, the first issue, I had like 200 hours of footage to come down. So there was no problem getting footage. And I, I actually would be interested to hear, you know, from your perspective, what it was like getting footage for Form 1 at the time. I mean, back then it was a bit, I was shooting a photo and then I put the camera down and start filming. And when we first started this, I remember talking to Steve because your mic's not working. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the whole idea was basically at first going back was it was just going to be based around the giant brands, and then it was changed quickly and said no, let's cover skateboarding, and. Um, and me being out there shooting for Thrasher, it was real easy just to have access to everybody because I was trying to shoot a photo and you know get them in Thrasher, but at the same time building up the archive of footage. And then I remember just you know a few months into this, it was just like, wow, the amount of footage we have. Wait, so were you like also like shooting photos and filming? Like, yeah, yeah. So I was shooting photos, photos and then let I was me filming. let me get a clip of this. Really and then quick. let me get clips of this. And back in the day, it wasn't. Um, it's kind of funny now that when you think about it, you know, it's a whole production now. Sometimes it's two filmers and yeah, a photographer and everything. But when we first started this project, it was just I was shooting the photo and filming at the same time, making them having to do it, you know, two times, sometimes three times. But, um, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, I wanted two different angles or something, so they'd have to redo it. Now it's like, I look back at that part and I laugh at it. But um, when we came back to the table, I remember Josh was just overwhelmed, like, what the fuck, man? Just, you know, but um, it, it was kind of an easy task, really, because of Thrasher made it easy because everybody was trying to get photos in the magazine, too. But at the same time, we were filming for, um, for, for our video magazine, yeah. Is that why you did the double length premiere issue? Or was that part of the plan anyway? No, I think that it was Super just fat fat when <laughs> the, the extra fat premiere issue. Um, 83 minutes, I think. But we, 
when when I was going through all this footage, like we were having discussions on like you know what goes in the video, and then we we I just got to a point when I was editing them like if it's good it goes in. It's what Paul said earlier. If this is good, it goes in. It doesn't matter what the filming looks like. It doesn't matter who the skater is because you know Steve being from from England and myself growing up in Kansas like we were used to being outside of the industry in many ways. And so the thought was, if you're a good skateboarder, you deserve to be in this video. You deserve to be featured no matter where you're from, who you are. If, if you skate bird, if you skate street, it, it wasn't, and that was it. And that's why we wound up making that longer issue because it's just like, we want to give credit to the people that are skating now because as you said, 93 was bleak. It was, it was, probably the depth of that time in skateboarding. You know, I think we had started a little bit of an upswing maybe, but skateboarding was tiny and it it didn't, <laughs> it's so funny to look at skateboarding today um, in, in comparison. Like, it's just bizarre to me that skateboarding's cool, it's in the Olympics, it's, it's all these things that it wasn't um, 30 years ago. But, you know, when we also started this project, once we had the foundation of a couple of names, you know, once we kind of said, hey, Jerry Ray's working on this with us. And, you know, we had, we had the supporting of the giant brands, which, you know, everyone that's in the first issue was somehow associated with the giant brands. But once we threw out a, a few of those names, you know, it, it was just an easy task to go out and, and finish. Hey, Jeremy, you here? Yeah, okay, can I jump in a second? I got a question for you. Okay. So, just on, on the first issue, Andy was like, we've got to get guns. We've got to get guns. We're like, we can't get guns. We're like, we've got to get them. I'm like, we're trying to get guns. We can't get guns. And I'm like, well, we've got Jeremy. And he's like, who's Jeremy? And I'm like, Jeremy Ray. He's like, no, I'm interested in Jeremy. And I'm like, it's him. So I'm like, let me send you this video. And he's like, Jeremy's cool. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> How did it feel for you doing a, giving a part or giving all this footage and time to like something that didn't even exist yet? Well, we were filming for a lot of things all at the same time. I was filming for the color video back then too. And I was hooking up with our teams a lot. They were shooting photos and filming all the time. And then we just have enough stuff to do that, the color video, and something else all at the same time. Yeah, so you don't want to was going somewhere. No, we were just filming. Like, I did, you know, different tricks on different Say if I had two fronts, I put one here and one there. One went to that, one went to the other one, you know? And just try to manage what went where. But, so, um, so every you know. day I went out with that guy, I banked 10 tricks minutes. I mean, that guy is a powerhouse. Yeah. And Jeremy Red is one of the guys that really helped. It, it, he helped kickstart the whole thing yeah. because first he, cover. First Covers cover. Made first part but you know everyone knew who he was and once we had the back end of Jeremy having the first part then a lot of other people wanted to follow suit so you know just kind of like any other video it's just you know you get those staple people to be in the video and, and a lot of other people want to be involved and did you guys have like Krieger and Costin pretty quickly right right yeah. after that Costin profile is a really interesting story actually you should <laughs> Tell it. <laughs> so, if I remember correctly, it was right around the time that uh, Costin was leaving 101 for Girl, right? Is that what that part was? I, I kind of think that that's what it was. So, so Costin was leaving uh, World and 101 to go, to go start Girl, and he had this part ready. And, and I think that they were so pissed at Rocco at the time they were kind of like, fuck you, I'm giving it to Formula One. So we got a full cost and profile because of like some industry turmoil. It was, it was really a, a unique, perfect timing opportunity. Can you talk about, speaking of industry turmoil, uh, can you talk about Grapevine and why it, the, the gossip section and why it had to stop? I don't remember off the top of my head or it, it was like we started doing it just because it was we were doing like an industry news type section 
but then we just started catching some heat, I think, for... <laughs> oh, oh, I remember what it was, actually. So it was, it was because we were announcing that people were leaving companies before it came out in magazines. And so what had happened is then those companies were getting stuck with tons of boards. So th I mean, nice. that's pretty much it, right? <laughs> so so I, I used to, at that time, uh, a company, when a writer would leave a company, you sort of had three months before the you know, picture gets taken, it's three months before it's in print in the magazine. So you had time to solve the business problem. And it was quickly now like, oh wait, it could be two weeks. You know, it was happening very quickly, you know? Maybe, I, don't, I don't want to cut you off, but maybe that's a good time to tell the story about the, the premiere. And then adding the footage into the video. So when I, I when I used to, if any of you guys used to read Rad Magazine, I used to have my own page. And what my page was was I used to, I used to Steve Douglas page, and because I was such a skateboarder and a skate nerd, at night I'd writing down tricks and what people were doing and the videos and all this stuff. And Tim Lake and Boyce knew that he could rely on me every every issue. So for the last day of the month, and right before we were going to print, I would fax him over all the news of what was going on in the states. But that. That, mag that magazine would come out the next week, whereas the American magazines were two or three months behind. So people were getting news what was going on in America a lot quicker just because of that. And so I, I took a lot of that stuff into we did a four, we did a four and one. So when we were starting four and one at the same time, Crash were getting ready to start their video, and there was some like, who's going to be the first one out, right? You think it was earlier, right? Oh, I don't know that. Okay, all right. So I, there, there was competition between the two of us. Right, and who, who was going to do it? And that, and that, pushed, for that pushed that pushed us on. So if you, if you go back to issue two and you look at the open, the ending credits, what we did is at, at the trade show we premiered number two, but we videotaped people watching the premiere. Then we showed video of a guy skating at ASR. Josh edited the video and we had it on sale the week after. That nearly killed him. But what we were trying to do was, hey, Trasher, you know what? We got this, you know what I mean? Like we can, we'll, we'll pull this out really, really fast. Someone will come out and we'll bring it out, and, and that's what we did. And we never did it again, right? I, I want to hear the Ortiz perspective. So Chris was working at Thrasher before. So Chris, Chris was working at Thrasher and shooting and videoing, um, but as we got through our first year and like moved to incorporating the company, we knew that Chris had to be like a part of the company because it was he was key in, in being in the field and bringing in the footage. And so, what, what, was, the, what was the Thrasher situation? So the Thrasher situation was, at the time I was shooting photos for Thrasher and um, shooting photos for Giant and filming for Giant only. And then, um, at the time I had called up MoFo and Kevin Thatcher and I, talked to them about starting this video magazine through giant distribution. And I was making sure there wasn't a conflict because it was still a magazine, even though it wasn't a paper magazine, it was still considered a magazine. And they were like, yeah, no problem, it's cool, it's cool. Well, then I got the phone call from a, um, someone above them <laughs> and so. told me, you cannot do that. And in order for you to continue working for Thrasher, you're gonna have to quit. And I was like, fuck, no. Like, <laughs> we have something here. And um, I said, no. And then all of a sudden, through the grapevine, I just basically hearing they were starting a video magazine, because I spilled everything to them, man, like a dumbass I was. I, I told them it's gonna be laid out. <laughs> I, I told him everything. I said, hey, we're building this just like a magazine, man. <laughs> so then we were in a race to get the first issue out because all of a sudden... Now we know why we're working so hard. <laughs> and, and I was stressing because I was like, fuck, oh, man, I told these guys everything. We're doing pro interviews and we're doing music sections and we're doing amateurs and, and yeah, so I... Josh under a lot of pressure. <laughs> hey, we can't let Thrasher beat us, you know? You almost sunk the ship before the ship even took sail. Yeah, really I did, Ricky. Um, but then, no, there was a lot of drama too because I remember like, you know, then I had to quit the magazine and then 
I called up Trans World and then I was shooting photos for Trans World. They were cool, but then also Trans World started their own thing. Did you put them in the formula too? <laughs> so they didn't get formula about that. But um, no, they did. We, it was a race because I kind of blew it. I was like, yeah, I did, I did blow that one. <laughs> it is what it is. Well, I was just going to say the, the interesting thing about it, and you know, sure, once you saw the first four and one, you could see what the formula was, but there is a lot that goes into getting that done. And, and one of the most important things that we did from the beginning that Steve really pushed on was getting gratis music rights. Like, we're using 15 or 20 songs an issue, and had we not, had Steve not really pushed on, hey, we're putting out a skateboard video. You really want your music in this. Why do you want your music in it? A bunch of kids are going to see it, and then they're going to go buy your, buy your music. And we weren't selling the videos based on the music, but the music has been one of the most important things. Like, I always hear from people who are like, that was the first time I heard this band. That was the first time I heard this song. I loved, like, the music piece really, I think, you know, music carries emotion when you're editing a video. And the emotion of when you hear the songs for the first time make a difference. And so the chance to expose all this music to this new audience allowed us to like hit up record labels, the biggest record labels on the planet eventually, and they would give us music for free. Uh, first, because Chris had her <laughs> tell, tell them how we got the music for the first few issues. My aunt just worked at um, MCA? MCA, yeah, my aunt worked at MCA, and basically we just faxed her a piece of paper and. She just starts signing off on like some amazing shit. Like, just I don't remember what songs, but I think it, that was when we were getting like uh, "Come On Eileen" song. Like yeah. all that stuff was on here. Yeah, Blondie. Blondie. Was that EMI? That, that was EMI. Yeah, but, so after that, but she signed off on probably the first five issues. She signed off on some amazing music that was off of <laughs> FCM, man and just never even flinched at it, and we never, nothing ever happened, but it, it was just a family connection, yeah. How many people here bought a CD because of 401? Jeremy Henderson's OG New Yorker back in the day. Like OG OG. Yeah. Talking about the guy in the orange hat? Yeah. It is Jeremy Henderson. He's talking to Steve Cab, so he's OG for sure. Jeremy Henderson is the oest of the OGs. <laughs> We're talking about Jeremy Henderson over here talking to Bob Boyle and Steve Caballero at the and it's April 11th, uh, 411 day. Here in Costa Mesa. Skate, you ain't going Who is that? Who has that guy in the orange? Jeremy Henderson, legendary New York skater. Chris Bond, Bond, lives Chris. in Newport Beach now. Lived in London in the 70s. Got pictures in all the magazines in the 70s and in, in the UK. And had the cover of Thrasher in 1990. And artist, good friends with Mark Gonzalez. He has a ton of Mark Gonzalez artwork in his house. I thought it was fun.
Hey, my name's Josh Friedberg. A lot of you probably don't have any idea of who I am, but I was one of the co-founders of 411 Video Magazine. Uh, we dropped the first issue in July of 1993. I was so psyched when I saw iDabble start coming across Instagram. Um, for me, I love skaters doing things in media, especially it's near and dear to my heart. So anytime there's a new project that's coming up that's especially run by skaters who are not only creative and inspired to do something, but they're also amazing skaters, it gets me psyched. <laughs> Forum One has spoken. Uh, we fully back iDabble. Mm -hmm.